Before we get started with the session, uh, is my mic alive and kicking? Number one. Number two, if the mic is alive and kicking, um, I do want to kind of highlight one thing. There's a virtual reality corner right, right there. Wave out. There you go. Uh, that some of you may have missed. Um, our partner, Surround Vision, has showcased about five different projects. The aim of the virtual reality experience is to immerse viewers. Oh, my mic's working. Fantastic. But I can throw my voice out there. Um, to immerse viewers and show the impact and innovation behind a variety of projects in the context of the SDGs. Uh, basically, what you have to do is put on the VR headset, transport yourself uh, inside the main globe hub interface, um, and then see the five project hotspots that are positioned on a spinning globe. I've been promised it sounds and feels really real. The experience they've created uh, is building on a successful framework that was developed for COP26. There was a lot of technology um, in COP, so I may have missed you guys, but this time around I won't. Um, the virtual reality corner is right there. I don't have to read this out to tell you where it is, but if you don't get a chance to go visit our partners right there, you will be given one of these when you leave uh, the pavilion tomorrow or even today. Is it tomorrow? Whenever you decide to leave, let them know you want this. What you do is take it home. You can open it up, stick a phone, and experience that at home. And if you don't want to, I know your kids will. So, don't forget to grab this on your way out. Right. Virtual reality is not what we're talking about today. We're going to be <laughs> deep diving into a very real situation at our borders that I know around the corner that's all they might have been talking about. So Ukraine is where we're going to focus uh, our attention. We're talking about tank diplomacy. I know it was mentioned here about whether by buying, doing, using things, uh, are we funding certain actions that are, be, are at play? So we're going to do a deep dive into this session and in terms of the alarming numbers that there's still debate, are they moving in, are they moving out? We're going to do a deep dive into that, into the war games and what's happening. So without further ado and without a long introduction, let's uh, invite Nicholas Connolly. He is Deutsche Welle's uh, Eastern Europe correspondent who is joining us virtually. Uh, let's get him up on screen. And he is doing an amazing job for DW out there. Vidar Helgeson is the uh, executive director of the Nobel Foundation. You all have met him over the last two days. Thank you, Vidar. <laughs> Stephen Varthim is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for joining us uh, on stage. <laughs> Galina Mihaljuk is uh, a member of parliament. Uh, from Ukraine, so brings a very key perspective to this conversation. And Arisia Lutsevich joins us online as well. She's joining us virtually, uh, and she is the research fellow and manager of the Ukraine Forum in the Russia Eurasia program at Chatham House. So we have a few people joining us virtually. That means we get a lot more of inputs in the one and a half hours we have to discuss this. Also, you'll notice there's an empty chair right there. This is an opportunity for you as experts to raise your hand, join the conversation for whichever parts are relevant to you and what perspective you can bring. This is an idea of leaving an open chair, so raise your hands. A couple of you have already reached out saying you will join the conversation, so I can't wait to get started. Let's do a deep dive. Let's uh, go straight to Nicholas and get a perspective from you, Nicholas. Thank you very much uh, for joining us and for putting this, uh, this session together. Give us a perspective of what's happening on the ground right now, as of today, uh, as of the latest movements that you're aware of, and how stressful is the situation where you are? So I'm in Kiev, um, where things feel largely normal. People are out uh, enjoying kind of an early spring day, but it is definitely uh, a kind of nervy situation. I think in the last few days, those um, reports of oligarchs and pro-Russian politicians leaving, scrambling to leave on private jets, that really spooked people, uh, foreign diplomats evacuating, even the Brits who seemingly wanted to hold out for longer now taking their embassy to Lviv in the west near the NATO-Polish border. Um, I was in Kharkiv up to recently, the second biggest city in Ukraine, which is about 50 uh, kilometers from the border. There, even less sense of kind of panic, but I think that's probably a kind of psychological self-protection mechanism. The more helpless you feel, the fewer 
more options, the more you're likely to try and discount um, any threats to your life. Um, but certainly still lots of international students there, people who just were looking at the locals and saying, well, if they're not panicked, then why should I leave? Um, I've been in Ukraine now for four years, and this is definitely very different. We've seen lots of escalations down the years when there was the incident with the uh, sailors in the Kerch Strait that ended up uh, spending time in a Moscow jail, but were eventually released, that kind of uh, regular tension. But this genuinely, qualitatively feels different. You, you know, colleagues have put uh, life decisions on hold, not taking mortgages, taking out money out of banks, making sure they have foreign currency in small denominations in case they need to leave, sending their kids to the villages to be with their grandparents in case something happens. Colleagues asking me where my nearest bomb shelter is, which in my case is a Soviet era metro station, which is very, very, very deep, which for us was always very annoying because it takes so long to get to the train. But now you think, well, actually, probably a good thing that they are so deep. Um, uh, I think the most extraordinary things, I think I never thought that as a journalist, I would be discussing different types of Soviet era missile. Now, you know, we're in a situation where journalists are asked to discuss the difference between different types of Iskander rockets and Smerdich and Grom and what are they, all the different names. And I, I just think it's important and interesting to discuss how we got to a situation where this is possible, but we are having to discuss this. And I think up till yesterday, or maybe the last couple of days, we had Annalena Baerbock calling this a Russia crisis rather than a Ukraine crisis, saying that these kind of methods um, are not normal diplomacy and shouldn't be allowed to continue. I think up to then we were kind of taking this as a given that Russia could do these kind of things. Um, it was just kind of not questioned where everyone was bogged down in the situation on the ground. And I think it's interesting to, yeah, that now there seems to be a growing recognition that even if there is no intervention, even if the worst is avoided, that these kind of methods are definitely uh, a break with what we've had before and something that, uh, you know, Europe needs to think about uh, how it's going to respond to this um, going forward. How does Europe respond to this, Vidar? I mean, you've been in a position where you've been able to observe this for a very long time. How should they and how will they? Two different things. Well, I think there, there are two big questions. What will Russia eventually do? And the other is what will the response be? Um, It is nothing new that Mr. Putin is using arms as a means of diplomacy, um, so we shouldn't be surprised. Um, he's done that with Chechnya, Georgia, Ukraine, Syria, Kazakhstan. He, and the question is, what, what lessons has he drawn from that? And I think he's drawn a lesson that largely it's been to his advantage. Um, in Munich in 2007, he gave a fairly scary perspective on, uh, on issues European. Nevertheless, Europe was surprised the year after when Georgia happened. We were surprised when Ukraine happened in 2014. We were surprised when Syria, the Syria intervention happened. Uh, so now I don't think we should be surprised. Um, the question then is, um, what response can possibly deter uh, further military action. And um, I think as we have been discussing also at this meeting, uh, there is promising unity on the European side or on the Western side. Um, but we've had a unity in the past as well in terms of condemnation, in terms of sanctions, and that hasn't really deterred him. So the question is, <laughs> what, what will happen this time around? Um, a, a Swedish ambassador to Moscow once said, mm -hmm. being asked how far, being asked by her foreign minister, how far will Mr. Putin go? And her response was, he will go as far as we let him. Uh, so the question is, how far will we let him, if that is a correct assumption? And, and I'm... I think a major question here is, is who is able to play the long game? Putin obviously is able to play the long game, although there are those saying that uh, his population is not informed and not prepared for war, uh, the tolerance for casualties if there is a real war might not be that high, economic sanctions could really hit this time. So um, he might be overplaying his hand. On the other hand, if you look at the West, uh, European economy will also be hit by sanctions uh, and counter sanctions. Uh, there is an energy crisis where Putin has some cards on his hand. 
Um, we know from recent experience what a refugee crisis might lead to in terms of political reactions in Europe. Um, and then there is Russian information warfare and cyber warfare as a potential. And quite unpredictable political arenas in, in Europe and in the US. So to the question of, of who, is best, who, who is best positioned to play the long game here, I'm actually not sure. So it's a, I, I wouldn't call myself an optimist, although I'm a bit encouraged by, by the unity we're seeing, but let's see how long that holds. Stephen, give us the American perspective. Is this time around, with this particular administration, more teeth uh, in the announcements, in the declarations, um, or is it going to be softly, softly after a lot of shouty, shouty? Well, we'll see. Um, this administration has, I think, done what most administrations in the United States would have done in handling this crisis. Um, perhaps one exception, it, President Biden took the use of force by the United States off the table very early, making it clear that there was a limit to how far the United States would go uh, in uh, the defense of Ukraine. Uh, and I think that speaks to a larger shift in U.S. foreign policy for at least a, a decade, um, if not uh, about 15 years, um, in the direction of more uh, restraint in U.S. policy as we've emerged out of what Americans called the unipolar moment um, and into a more uh, competitive uh, and challenging international environment. But uh, having taken the use of force off the table, the administration has tried to make a go at diplomacy while I think never really believing it would succeed. Um, it's probably the time for debating what might have worked, uh, might, what might have been done differently is, seems to be coming to, to an end. And while the administration, I think, did a good job in rallying uh, its European allies, uh, I think things are going to get much more difficult now um, because the key questions will be um, exactly what uh, degree of punishment is applied to Russia. I don't think there's going to be an international intervention against Russia, um, but what degree of sanctions is a very difficult uh, subject because it's hard to see how... Um, uh, you know, too little, and it won't uh, be much of a statement. Uh, too much, and it's probably counterproductive. Um, Russia has adjusted to sanctions from 2014 by building its uh, domestic economy. It's also uh, cl drawn closer to China, and we've just seen that um, Russia was able to get the support of China this time around in a way that it didn't. Um, in, in 2014. So there are not very good choices. I think um, over the medium to long term, mm -hmm. the really difficult question is uh, what to do about the European security architecture. Uh, I think we've come to an end of the post-Cold War European security architecture. Mm. It always had flaws, and now those flaws may make it unsustainable going forward. Uh, in short, the United States attempted, I think, to do too much, uh, Europeans too little in the defense of Europe, and Russia was left on the margins of that order from the very beginning. Uh, and it's going to be, I think, a very difficult adjustment to try to find a framework that can be sustainable um, going forward. I think, Arisi, I'm going to come to you before I go to Galena, just because I want to get your perspective from all of the parties you're listening to. Um, in the Ukraine forum, uh, people you're talking to across the world at Chatham House, what, are, what is the sentiment? Is this constant flux that we keep feeling about uh, the conversations, oh, we want to do something, we, the world order has changed, but what do we do because we haven't done the green transition as fast as we'd like to, we're still stuck with um, you know, the gas pipeline issue, the energy crisis, but we seem to be paying for Mr. Putin's um, vanity projects of trying to take over countries. I mean, at some point, what are you hearing in terms of solutions 
um, that are being proposed, or is it just a lot of noise at this point that people like Nicholas and I would be going on air or talking about and reporting on? Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to join you. I wish I were in Munich with you. It looks like a beautiful day. Uh, but it has been troubling weeks, uh, I mean, if not months, since December of last year to now, when we are all in this state of perpetual anxiety and, and we see Putin waging really this war of attrition against Ukraine and I would argue also against the uh, European Union and NATO. And, and it's, it's, I think, uh, quite shocking for, uh, for Western community, much less shocking for Ukraine because Ukraine is facing direct military invasion already for eight years, to acknowledge how vicious and how, um, in a way, Russia is ready to raise the stakes. Yes, they've done it before. They've done it in Georgia. They've subjugated Armenia, for example, to withdraw from negotiations of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. They are now swallowing Belarus. So they are on the perpetual march of expanding Russian territory in its periphery because that Russia believes will give its a, 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 a superpower status and also it will undermine the spread of Western liberal order and democracy, especially in the Russian neighborhood and former uh, Soviet Union states. Uh, I, I would say if I compare to 2014, specifically to Ukraine, we see much more resolve and definitely much more unity, much less ambiguity about what actually is going on on the ground. And you started by showing this virtual reality glasses. What we face is that, you know, honestly, Russian leadership and its people, they live in virtual reality. And this is so dangerous because we have millions of people, country with the nuclear weapons, the permanent member of UN security. Security Council denying the value of facts and truth. And, you know, as we speak this weekend, there is a major um, false flag operation undergoing in the occupied parts of the East, in the Donbass and Luhansk parts of the regions, where uh, these occupational authorities are pretending that Kyiv is um, prepared to wage, you know, a war against them. They have, uh, civilians are simply uh, being, you know, hostages, I would argue, that are being moved to Russia, Rostov region, uh, and uh, they, they're completely manipulated in, in this situation. And, and I think this is where the difficulty in using diplomacy as we, you know, study in books and we want to practice comes, how do you negotiate with this kind of Russia that denies that its troops are in Ukraine, that is speaking the language of fake genocides at the chamber of the UN Security Council, and that holds people hostages? And, and I think this is a big question for us. Um, I, honestly, I think there's a limit to how much could be done uh, of the goodwill around the negotiating table, regardless how big that table is. And we've seen a lot of jokes uh, going about that. And it seems like the, the, uh, the more rivalry, the larger the table, the smaller uh, table means uh, more uh, cooperation. But I would say we have to persevere because this is, like you say, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Uh, and I agree with the German foreign minister who says it's a Russia crisis and it's beyond Ukraine at this point. Ukraine is in the front line. So the more we strengthen Ukraine, Ukraine's resilience to persevere, the more we have the outcome of the European security that mm -hmm. will respect sovereignty of the states, yeah. that will stop put an end to the spheres of influence, and there will be price that European economies and communities will have to pay. It will not come for free mm -hmm. to anybody in Europe. The question is whether this burden is willing to be shared jointly. And yeah. I see a certain, and I hear that to a certain degree, yes. Um, and, and I think this gives us hope. Hope is what we need, Galena, isn't it? Because at some point, your government's under huge pressure because promises are being made, the words are being spoken, but as we can see, the actions may not back the, the things that you need to bring back stability in the country. So from a perspective that I'm curious about, um, tell us what you're seeing, but also your opposition parties, your, um, uh, your colleagues in parliament, are they all unified at this moment? Or are we seeing fractures within 
the government in Ukraine as well, beyond what we already know? Can you give, paint a picture for us of what's going on in the political circles? I should admit that uh, uh, everyone is unified now because we have uh, one huge prob pro problem is Russia and our borders. Um, of course, uh, um, like we are in a majority. The presidential faction is 254 MPs out of 427. Um, in total, we should have 450 MPs, but uh, uh, 27 seats are for Crimean territories, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. So uh, they are empty nowadays in the parliament for, the, for, uh, for a number of years. That's why we have currently 323 MPs. Uh, small opposition parties, uh, uh, they tried their best uh, uh, to use uh, any kind of manipulations uh, to their benefit, but uh, we've really last week strongly asked and President uh, called every, for all the opposition parties to be united at least now. Mm -hmm. um, and we do our best uh, um, to have united parliament and if someone has observed our votings just this week, uh, the majority of laws, draft laws, they were adopted with constitutional, this 300 plus votes in favor or unanimous, uh, unanimous decisions. Um, the draft laws that needed to increase the state budget in terms of defense uh, capacities and some urgent measures that need to be done, not only in terms of security, but also we need to keep in mind that currently Ukraine is in, on the highest peaks of COVID. We have the, the hugest ever wave of COVID nowadays, but no one talks about it because it's already on the second, you know, or, 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 or like it's not in top 10 priorities of Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go on. Fin if, uh, this is this is fascinating because we get we forget that there are real people involved. There are real issues that are go currently holding us back globally, but that's still happening in Ukraine as well. On top of the fact that yeah. we have tanks, we have soldiers that supposedly were getting pulled out but are not. That they're drumbeats of war, and then we keep hearing that this is going to keep continuing until the false flags that we've been talking about continue. So. Paint a real picture for us here. What are we looking at beyond just COVID? How bad is it? And how much pressure is the medical system under at this point? Yeah, um, just one clarification. I've told that a position um, wanted to manipulate with some facts. One clear example, um, every day we had like plus 10 MPs with COVID. Uh, that's what, in, in on the majority faction, that means that people could not come uh, to the plenary hall because they are positive, they, they need to stay home or in the hospital. And the opposition was telling, oh, they're not coming because they're going to evacuate themselves and their families. So that's why, but, you know, but the reality is different. And of course, this kind of, this information might destabilize even more the situation um, among the citizens of Ukraine. That's why, well, they stopped, thanks God, to use any, any tricks um, in their favor. Um, well, just recently, uh, yesterday after our dinner, uh, I had uh, a conversation with uh, our MPs who landed yesterday uh, evening uh, for the Munich Security Conference. And till midnight we were discussing uh, what are possible options, what are the current situation, what are the scenarios. These are MPs from different parties, not only presidential one, but from opposition one, but we are, we are united, we are, we are Ukrainian MPs without any kind of faction affiliation um, here in Munich. And we were like talking for two hours and then one of us told, okay, is there any positive option or only the negatives are considered? Um, it's true that uh, recent two days uh, we have uh, um, huge uh, uh, escalation of the conflict. Yesterday it was announced, as it was mentioned by all our colleagues, that they started to evacuate people from Donetsk and Lugansk areas. Uh, by the same mean children and women. Uh, they, uh, they were given six hours to be evacuated somewhere in the middle of Russia. Men are forced uh, uh, to join uh, um, DNR and LNR army. Uh, so no, no perspective as to future plans, as uh, our first speaker has told us. Yesterday also we had uh, explosion of uh, um, gas pipeline in Lugansk area. 
So it's, it's coming more and more. So I was absent just for one day in Ukraine. Uh, yesterday I was here with our colleagues uh, for the Munich Security Conference. But it seems that uh, I was out for, for a week or months. There's so much information. Like every hour I'm getting information about what is the situation uh, uh, on the front zone, front line. And uh, as of today, um, the, first sol the first dead soldier was at 6 a.m. And then like every hour plus you have uh, attacks on the front line uh, that uh, breach uh, Minsk agreement. For example, as of 9 a.m. today, we had nine, 19 attacks on the front line and 18 of them um, with a breach of Minsk agreement. Uh, before our panel here, I was listening to uh, this, the, the speakers of Munich Security Conference, uh, um, German Prime Minister Olaf Scholz, uh, and also uh, Secretary General uh, of NATO. And uh, I was uh, shocked by some uh, um, information that they, they were describing. Olaf Scholz told that last week he was in Ukraine uh, meeting with the, our president and then the next day he was meeting with Putin in Moscow and that both sides of the conflict, this direct speech, uh, that they agreed that Minsk agreements uh, should be fulfilled in a full scale. Um, Minsk, fulfillment of Minsk agreement is a legal way of a uh, full escalation of Russia, of full occupation of Russia in Ukraine. So, um, what, 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 just in simple terms, what do Minsk agreement mean? That the elections will be held uh, on the territory of uh, Donuts Republic and Lugansk Republic. Uh, pe people who will be elected will be from the separatist movement. They will be legally in the parliament in the power, and it's just the first step for Ukrainians to lose their sovereignty forever, because it will, you know, it will spread like virus. Yep. That's why yeah, um, it is highly important for international society to understand that uh, there is no way that Ukraine will uh, um, talk to the representatives of uh, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk Republic as if they are our counterparts or they are on the same level as yeah. we do. Because uh, um, the Minsk agreement in, in their sense is like elections first and yeah. then the security. But for us it's like security first and then the elections. How do you balance that? Because at some point you can hear the disappointment in what Mr. Schultz has announced. It really does come back to this conversation about energy. <laughs> Let's be honest, that's exactly what's happened here. Um, at some point it's almost like we're paying for these war games. We, we need the the energy to come into Europe, but we don't seem to want to find an alternative. We don't even have LNG space to take the alternatives that the US would love to send us. I think in, in some way Europe is paying now for not having invested enough in alternative uh, energies over the last uh, decade. Um, but it was kind of interesting to see when Scholz was in Washington how Biden sent the message that if Russia attacks Ukraine, uh, there will not be a Nord Stream 2. Whereas Scholz didn't say as much, but he implied as much. Um, so um, I think there is, a, there is a movement there as well. If I can go back to you, Nicholas, give us your perspective from covering this for a long, long time. Um, as Delina said, you know, the movement and news flow has been so tremendous in the 24 hours she's not been there. What exactly is uh, truth in terms of the eyes of the people of, the, of Ukraine or even in the Eastern Front? What are they hearing about the movements, about the news? What are they considering fact? What are they considering fiction? And what do you want to hear out of the MSC in the next 24 hours? So I, I think in terms of those uh, Russian troop movements, I think you know, this is something that you know, ordinary citizens level and journalists are just not in a position to judge adequately. I mean, you know, in terms of those Russian troop movements within Russia proper, there are no observers there. Um, Russia has kind of basically circumvented its normal um, uh, responsibilities through the kind of Vienna document by saying this is not one big 
troop uh, exercise. These are lots of parallel smaller ones, and so they're under the kind of threshold in terms of manpower that would require international observers. Um, so basically, we're just left kind of looking at satellite pictures and, you know, <laughs> Uh, maybe some people are more skilled at this, but you know, really you have journalists discussing if snow lying on the roof of a tent means that it's unoccupied and so there are fewer people on the ground, or if it, the, the roof is dark and the snow is melted, that means there are people in it. So it's all pretty uh, abstract and difficult to really judge, but it does seem right that those troops that left Crimea returned to their home garrisons, which are in Rostov and in Belgorod or other places near the border, so that doesn't change the actual balance of Russian uh, forces on that Ukrainian border. And the, the forces that had come in from the Far East, from Siberia, that had really made that long journey, they don't seem to be moving anywhere. On top of that, you had U UK intelligence talking about 7,000 new troops. Um, so uh, as far as that's concerned, it really seems that that was just a kind of short-term move to try and signal some kind of goodwill towards Olaf Scholz when he was in Moscow, but nothing more than that. Um, in terms of what's happening in Donbass, again, we've there, there are still some OSCE people there, but fewer than before. Lots of countries have withdrawn their observers. Um, and the most important thing is those observers, even in the past, didn't uh, operate at night for safety reasons. So most of the fighting there happens at night. So we have no idea what's going on at night. Most of the time they have to say, we can't, we can't really, you know, with any certainty say, who fired first. This is a very low-tech war. This isn't, you know, missile. This is really weapons from the 1940s, 50s, 60s. Um, stuff that even with the best tech, if you're not on the ground, you can't you know, reconstruct who is responsible for what. Um, and that's been you know, the issue all these years. So there's, you know, uh, you know the, the fog of war. You know, everyone is now a military export, quoting Clausewitz or whatever. But I think that genuinely does apply here. Um, and in terms of what, I mean, can happen, come out of Munich, well, uh, I, I think it's just a question, you know, from a Ukrainian perspective, you know, Ukraine wants uh, sanctions on the table now. They want them to be spelled out and they want them to be more painful than what we've seen before. Certainly the people you talk to here in Kiev say just cancelling uh, Nord Stream 2 is as, as big as a step, it seems, for, seems to German policymakers, is not enough. It needs to go further. It needs to be more painful to Russia in terms of uh, raising the price, in terms of maybe, I don't know, energy embargo, whatever. But then again, we, we were getting these reports of Mario Draghi's supposedly planning to try and do a kind of bilateral Italian-Russian energy diplomacy to get a promise out of the Russians that if sanctions were imposed, that uh, you know, energy supplies for Italy would be continued. So from a Ukrainian perspective, definitely lots of worrying signals that Europe isn't willing to pay a significant economic price, even though I checked the weather early on in uh, Italy right now, no sub-zero temperatures anywhere in any big city in Italy. So even in a situation where it's not particularly critical weather-wise in terms of you know the situation for ordinary citizens. If already that means that a big country like Italy is willing to kind of break out from that Western unity and try and strike a bilateral deal, then pretty worrying from a Ukrainian perspective um, how yeah how how that Western unity is going to hold up under pressure. Let's open this up since everyone here has a perspective on this particular issue. And um, if if I can um, ask Jessica if she's around. Um, if she can actually come and join us in the fishbowl uh, for her perspective as well. Is Jessica around? If she's not, then... What, where is she? Oh, there she is. Sorry, big pillar. Blocks my view. If you can join us, give us your perspective from a foreign policy uh, angle um, and tell us, what are we missing here? What's the picture we're missing? The picture we're missing... I'll, I'll speak from, from my perspective as a German. Um, I'm a German and American uh, for dual citizen. Um, but as a, as a German, we are missing a serious reality check. Um, we talk about our responsibility to the past. We talk about our responsibility to the legacy of the war. Um, and what this means for peace and freedom in Europe, um, but through the lens of what we shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't uh, send weapons to Ukraine. We, we shouldn't um, get into a conflict with Russia uh, because of our history. But when I think of our history and what, what historical lessons and situations should be informing and, and guiding um, our decision-making and our policy-making um, in this crisis, I think of the early 1960s, when, uh, when the Soviet Union, um, through the East German government, built the Berlin Wall. And West Berlin became slowly but surely cut off um, from uh, the rest of West Germany and was literally surrounded by Soviet aggression and was threatened with invasion 
at any moment. And there was real fear um, in the city. And in 1963, almost 60 years ago, John F. Kennedy came to Berlin and said that the peace and the freedom of West Berlin is the peace and freedom of all of us. And therefore, in the name of all free people, I, JFK, stand here and say, Ich bin ein Berliner. And I, I look at our politicians today, I look at the situation in, in, in Ukraine, and I say, in Kiev, all across Ukraine, Sie sind auch Berliner. They are also Berliners. We in Germany need to stand with Ukraine, with Ukrainians, just as the Americans stood with us during, world, uh, during the Cold War and basically ensured the Soviet Union that we were not, the Americans were not going anywhere and that the freedom of West Berlin was the freedom of all of us. And uh, to any, any Germans in particular um, in this room, whether you're a citizen or a policymaker, we need to have a conversation with our people and with each other at the civic and at the political level. We need a new conversation about the role of, of Germany in Europe and in the world because it's our responsibility as the ma a major trading partner and consumer of um, Russia. Uh, the power is in our hands here. The responsibility in our hands is not just to the past, but to the future of Europe. I know there's a question uh, at the back, if I can get a mic. There's a mic coming your way. Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, from Syria. And I was invited by Kiev Post a newspaper in English in Kiev to talk about Russian intervention in Syria and the similitude with Ukraine. Uh, it was fantastic to see how are how many are the similitude between the both cases: mercenary and, and phosphoric bombs and criminal of war. But unfortunately, now we hear about the Western position. Uh, I met with many of the leaders of this West country, Western country, since 2010. Their answer, it was, go discuss with Russia. Don't ask us any help. Go to arrange yourself with Russia. And I think now they don't say the same thing, but they think the same. Unfortunately, one of the uh, senior advisors of Putin told me very cynically, but at least he was frank, because I come from Aleppo city, told me, I am sorry for you, my friend. We are not friends, hopefully. For Aleppo, it will be Grozny solution. In a meeting with hundreds of people, and he was very smiling guy and without any regret. Even Putin, he said on the TV, in Russian TV, we used to prepare our maneuver in Siberia with artificial target to test our weapons. Mm -hmm. Now we do it in Syria, it's warm, it's Mediterranean Sea, our soldiers spend a holiday, and we use our new weapon against norm, uh, real target. All those declarations is under hearing, under seeing of all the people in the world. And we told, they told us, go to Russia, go to Moscow, discuss with Moscow. What discuss with Moscow? After one million people killed in Syria, what we want, you want us to discuss with Moscow? And I, I am very uh, scared from Ukraine, because the reality in the mind of the Western decider it's not like the declaration. Be careful, but because you lost already Crimea, you will lost all Ukraine if you trust them again. I think we can, we can, we can appreciate the emotion there from all of what Aleppo and all of Syria has lost. And it does feel, um, and I'm going to leave this open to 
all of you to try and take up, does feel like we're leaving Ukraine hanging just as we did the Syrians. Stephen, do you want to start, start us off? Sure. And it's not just this moment, it's 2014 and before. Now, I, th <laughs> I think that um, the West, specifically the NATO alliance, has dangled the prospect of membership for Ukraine for some time. In 2008, uh, the alliance declared that Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. It was not a serious statement. Uh, no membership action plan was forthcoming for Ukraine. And understandably, Ukrainians want to know where is the support beyond expressions of solidarity. Expressions of solidarity aren't going to mean much if Russia is undertaking a determined effort uh, to, uh, to attack Ukraine, perhaps to change the regime. We'll have to see what happens. So there are serious limits. And, um, you know, I think that <laughs> that approach of holding the door open um, is not a responsible approach. If we're serious about extending membership, then that's one thing. But if we're not, uh, these kinds of flirtations, uh, they're not only sort of providing false hope, they can be dangerous because people make calculations based on what they expect to happen. Uh, so I fear that the kind of Western approach leading up to this moment um, has been provocative, provocative enough to potentially change Russian behavior, uh, but has not involved a serious commitment to defend Ukraine. And that's really the worst of both worlds. Is this about broken trust now, folks? At some point, um, should the Ukrainians trust any word from the West if there's no backup plan or any backing up of any of the commitments? Yes, please, Aritzia. Thank you so much for bringing me in. First of all, I, I disagree with this gloomy analysis that the West is just dangling a candy and it's not really standing with Ukraine. And I think there's a quite clear appreciation inside Ukraine of Western assistance. There, I'm sure Nicholas has seen this rally of people on the Maidan bringing different flags of different nations who are supporting Ukraine in these dire times. And there were UK flags, there were US flags, Canadian flags. Unfortunately, there was no German flag for you know reasons we all know. And, and I think uh, panelists spoke very potently about it. So I think there is an understanding now, with the kind of tank diplomacy or heavy metal diplomacy that Putin is deploying beyond Ukraine, that, you know, Russia is really like this gang with guns that's on the side of Europe, is asking everybody to open their door, open their windows, leave the keys in and make it an police zone. So I, I think that, that, of course, the threat perception is different depending on what part of town you live in and how close you are to this gang. But we see um, a clear consolidation of uh, describing Russia as a uh, destabilizing power uh, that is here to decouple U.S. and European coalition that has been set up after the Second World War and is here to redraw what happened, uh, you know, as the outcome of the end of the Cold War and collapse of the Soviet Union. And I think, honestly, what we see right now is the coalition of the willing that is emerging uh, with Ukraine, nations such as Poland, such as Baltic states, such as United Kingdom, such as Canada, even Turkey, all chipping in to uh, boost Ukraine's deterrence. In 2014, this was not the case. And we know the position of Obama who thought that Russia will always have an escalatory dominance. This is not the policy of the United States right now. And I think in the midterm, we have to understand what Russian real threat is. It's not NATO. And that's why I think we should talk as little as possible about NATO, because Russia is not afraid of NATO. Deep down, Russia has anxiety of disintegration of Russia. Let's be honest. They, are, they don't know how to govern this territory rather than by expansion. 
you know, expansion in land, and they are afraid to be a junior partner of China. And there is will be a public opinion inside Russia, including in the ruling elite, who will see how this. Uh, uh, I wouldn't even call it co partnership, but this alliance of convenience at the time when Russian leadership decided to attack uh, West will, uh, will cause dearly to Russia. And I think, honestly, this is one of the squeezes that will uh, be advantages to um, the outcome of this uh, situation. So we should not be afraid of Russia, China, rapprochement. Let them make their own mistakes. Uh, and, and I think um, in the end, um, there's a fundamental problem where Ukraine has chosen rule-based order, European integration and NATO integration. And it's true that neither NATO nor European Union does not know where to place Ukraine. This is the conversation that has to happen in Munich, has to happen in Paris, has to happen in Berlin. Where do you see Ukraine belonging? Because Ukraine has no security umbrella. Uh, it will militarize itself. This is what President Zelensky is doing. Ukraine is increasing the uh, count of soldiers, is spending more on defense. Yes, this is one of the answers to Ukraine. You have to have a strong army with such neighbor and then build strong alliances of, con uh, of coalitions of the willing to withstand and protect sovereignty. And I think so far, so good. But let's see how far Russia will be prepared to go. Stephen, you're nodding, you're shaking your head there. Uh, well, I think uh, just U.S. policy is what Obama uh, said toward the end of his presidency, a recognition that the United States does not have vital interests uh, at stake in Ukraine and uh, that uh, Russia uh, can escalate. And so I think Biden has acted in a way that is uh, consistent with uh, where President Obama left things, I think the circumstances are are what's changed. And um, again, I just uh, do not think that there was a realistic option for uh, Ukraine to have joined NATO. Mm. I think uh, Russia has shown it is determined to prevent that from happening. Um, 2008 with Georgia, 2014, um, and so that's a recipe for, um, for a wider conflict, I'm afraid. Uh, so this is a very, very difficult uh, situation. I think my own view is that looking back, a more determined effort uh, in the direction of neutrality, uh, which did work for more than a decade after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, that at least would have been a more coherent approach, obviously, coming out of this crisis, I think there'll be a coherent case to make on the other side that more should have been done uh, to support Ukraine. That makes sense. I just don't think that that, I think that would have been a bluff uh, on the part of the uh, members of NATO. And uh, bluffs are not um, ultimately stabilizing. If I can get uh, Jessica uh, and Vidar and Galina just to follow up on that very quickly, and then I will invite you to step down and invite the next fellow to join us. I'm not sure if it was uh, directed at us, but I think I saw Nick's hand um, on, on screen a moment ago as well. Uh, Sorry, Nick, you're being uh, Nick. outshone by the, sh by the sun in my eye, but I will get to you. Um, very briefly, I think it's dangerously nearsighted uh, to to consider uh, Ukraine's uh, sovereignty uh, question um, as, a, as a question of the sphere of Russian influence and, and not in America's long-term strategic interest. This is not only about Ukraine, right? Russia is, Vladimir Putin is trying to restore some, uh, some semblance of Russian greatness and relevance on the world stage, not by building up the Russian economy, um, and turning Russia into a flourishing uh, modern society, but by sowing chaos, tearing down neighbors, and sowing discord um, in any countries he perceives as a challenge. All right, look at what happened in the US election, um, and all across in Eastern Europe, um, even Russian attacks on the German elections. Look at Wagner Group in the Sahel. They've understood that migration, refugee flows, are a huge leveraging point uh, with, with the European Union, for example. 
And what's happening in Ukraine can be replicated in Syria, across the Sahel. The French are leaving Mali. Who's there? Wagner Group. You know, this is not just about Ukraine. This is a long-term strategic threat from Russia to sow discord on its own terms and make the West respond. And so how we respond in this crisis right now for Ukraine on our own doorstep here in Europe, here in NATO, uh, will we'll set the, the course for the next decade of uh, Russian-induced chaos. I think what is different now under Biden from the situation uh, when Obama said what he said is that Russia has much more explicitly this time challenged the European security architecture. They have put out demands. Um, last, in 2014, Ukraine, the attack came as a surprise. This time, we've had a build-up uh, with diplomatic demands, political demands, and an invasion following on that would be a much more explicit challenge, not to Ukraine only, but to the European security order. And the US has stakes in the European security order. Uh, that is not to suggest that a military response would be the right thing in Ukraine, but a robust response. And I think there are good reasons for uh, new negotiations around the European security architecture, but they shouldn't be brought about by military action. And they should be long-term and not uh, something done under the, the threat of the use of force. The Helsinki Accords took seven years, I think, to negotiate. And uh, one should take the time uh, and the diplomatic effort needed to to uh, undergo such negotiations, and, and the current situation is not conducive to that. To peaceful conversations. Nicholas. Um, two points. I just, uh, firstly, I think it's kind of naive to think that we can somehow, you know, dial back on Western promises to Ukraine and go to a kind of, you know, basically undefined, quasi-neutral uh, sort of state for Ukraine, as was the case in the 90s, early 2000s. Um, I think Russian thinking is different now. They don't, they're not willing to go back there. They obviously didn't um, stick to their commitments under the Budapest agreements um, of, you know, respecting Ukraine's borders uh, in return for Ukraine giving up its nuclear arsenal. So. I think if you, we just have to take Putin at his word. I mean, he wrote that 7,000 word essay that you can find on the Kremlin website in Ukrainian, in Russian, in Spanish, in German, any language you care to look at. He does not think this is a legitimate country. He says this is a made up country that was made up by the Polish and Austrian secret services to weaken Russia. I think, you know, if he makes these what are essentially threats repeatedly, not just in private to foreign leaders, but in public and has it on his website, I think we have to take him at his word and realize that, you know, if if the West pulls back and says, okay, we can't offer NATO membership, um, we can't offer more support, then that, you have to be honest that that basically means, you know, seeing Ukraine turn into Belarus in five or 10 years. I don't think there is going to be a return to the kind of previous balancing state between uh, the West and Russia that was uh, kind of the characteristic of Ukraine in the 90s. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's kind of important to look at. And I think the other thing is our perception of Russian power. I mean, I think it has to be repeated over and over again. 140 million Russians, the economic output is just large, slightly larger than what 40 million Spaniards produce. Obviously, Russia is able to mobilize power and economic resources much more effectively than a democracy could because they're able to, you know, impose losses of standard of living on their population without fear of kind of blowback. They are able to make decisions much faster than uh, democratic societies would be. But this is not some kind of extraordinary superpower. This is a, a country that is doing a very good, uh, you know, act in uh, scaring Europeans who collectively have far, far greater resources at their disposal. And um, I'm, I'm always impressed at how, uh, you know, that psychological uh, posturing and, you know, the, the visits of people like Borrell to Moscow, him allowing himself to be shown up and to be humiliated on stage, you know, and him seemingly kind of, you know, not responding to that, not storming off. Same, you know, Liz Truss going unprepared, uh, not seemingly knowing which regions belong to Russia and which belong to Ukraine. That is all uh, a failure to prepare and a kind of, to my mind, extraordinary kind of uh, carelessness, but one that's not really, you know, <laughs> if you look at the hard facts, you know, that kind of response to Russia isn't really borne out by the, the true uh, balance of power. Um, I want to go to Galina, but uh, I'm going to invite Jessica to step off, and uh, if I can invite Imka Raja, uh, Rajamani to join us uh, on, uh, on the stage. Um, Galina, pick up where we left off. Give us your perception of what everyone said. 
just wanted to mention a couple of points. Uh, the first one, you, you have talked about energy security. Um, food for thought, uh, having the Nord Stream 2, at least the, the pipeline, this is an official uh, legitimate reason for Russia to be present in the Baltic Sea to protect its critical infrastructure, the pipeline. So it's like just legitimization why to be present. And you know, when we talk about Baltic Sea, this is uh, uh, the next step after Ukraine is Baltic countries plus Poland plus uh, um, Romania. Well, um, the perspective is that uh, um, the extra profits from energy uh, supply of, of Russia in 2021 20, uh, was um, 55 billion euro compared to the 2020 it was 25 so actually russia doesn't care a lot about economic sanctions that will be imposed or that are imposed because uh, having this huge uh, revenues from a uh, gas prices increase i mean it, it covers their losses completely uh, we know that uh, uh, Putin's agenda for 2020 is to have pro-Russian Ukraine at any cost. Again, pro-Russian Ukraine in 2022 at any cost. We should realize that he will not act as a Napoleon uh, in previous centuries. So he will do his best to manipulate and uh, he will cut, he might cut Ukraine from gas, from energy. I mean, he will do as, as if with evacuation of our people to, to Russia. So he, he will, he, he doesn't want to lose his face in front of international partners if he will do the invasion, the full scale from the military side. But he will find another tricks and uh, we expect it to be by the 22nd of February. The no there are a number of reasons why 22nd of February because uh, um, his friend in China will celebrate uh, the closing of Olympic Games on 21st of uh, February. So he will not disturb the celebration of Olympic Games. It will be done just right afterwards. Um, secondly, the plan was uh, uh, to conquer Ukraine in 2014 on 22nd of February. This is his favorite date. It's like it will be very very nice, like 22nd uh, 02 of 2022. Uh, we know it's for sure, that's why um, we have special special attitude to, to the next Tuesday. Uh, I mean, what is, what is going to be the plan? That's why uh, we really, uh, we are grateful uh, to international partners uh, in terms of uh, attention that is paid now to uh, the situation in Ukraine. Um, just uh, within the recent two weeks, we have a number of international delegate, delegations visiting uh, Office of the President, Ukrainian Parliament. Just last Wednesday uh, in the morning, we had delegation of uh, uh, Lithuanian Parliament, Parliament um, to, our, to our Ukrainian Parliament. And when Lithuanian MPs, they were having a speech, uh, one of them was having a speech in front of our parliament, he was crying. Yeah, it was so much emotional that uh, well, we, we are here with you. Um, we would like to have the same attention, international attention in 2014, while we didn't, because everyone was thinking, oh, it's an internal crisis, we don't know what's the reality there, is it like Ukrainians uh, fighting with each other? Well, for us it was obvious, and international society realized that it's not Ukrainians fighting with each other, it's like Ukra Russian ambitious to restore the borders of Russian empire, yep. and this... Um, uh, the sense to realize the situation came to international partners, it seems, too late. When, when the territories were lost yeah. already. We, 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 today we um, have a special day um, in 2014. More than 120 people were killed. Uh, um, it was a revolution of dignity. It, it has happened, happened 19th of February uh, 2014. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, a couple of days afterwards, uh, our ex-president escaped from country. But it was the starting point when, when the, all the citizens of Ukraine told, no, we will not treat anymore this kind of uh, uh, situation as it was in 2014. Mm -hmm. That's why yeah, uh, we are grateful for having attention now, 
but uh, uh, sanctions after the invasion to Ukraine, does it help or it's better to make something that will prevent the escalation of the situation? That's a really, really valid point, isn't it? Do we act after the fact or do we prevent the fact in itself from happening? Um, let's get your perspective as well, Anke. Yeah, thank you. I actually um, want to point at the elephant in the room because we call it tank diplomacy, but I think it's a fear diplomacy at the moment. And we talked about many emotions, for example, the moment of surprise, um, the moments of distrust, of course, the immense fear. And um, I was wondering um, if that moment of trust is over, so what's left, and is there actually any alternative to re-establishing trust? Um, you say the window of negotiation has closed, but if you take that emotion out, and I think it's the fundamental emotion that kind of is the base of any diplomacy, then is there anything else, you know, like then really, yeah, look, of violent answers back? That's what I'm fearing. And a question I have to you is kind of what is, um, because the fear is a violent experience in itself. So the war has already started before the first, before the first shots were actually fired. And I'm wondering what is the strategy of um, the Ukrainian government in kind of managing the fear and what is the help you can get from the Western allies in order to manage that fear? Should we start with you, Galina? And also I would like Arisia to input into that question as well. Stop there. Of course, there is a lot of uh, disinformation in pro-Russian media, propaganda. Uh, we do our best, uh, uh, especially information that was mentioned by, uh, by a colleague that uh, oligarchs are leaving the country, like uh, mass evacuation of, of people, refugees. Um, what the government do is all high officials are in the country. All MPs uh, are pro-governmental, let's say, presidential faction are in the country. We have initiated uh, this week the draft law that will deprive an MP uh, from the mandate if a person will leave Ukraine in a case of uh, a military stance. So you go out of Ukraine, you lose your mandate. Uh, the situation is, as, as you might know, that we have uh, a pro-Russian opposition. They are like minority, but still they are like 38 people in the parliament. 20 of them already for a couple of weeks abroad, so uh, they, are, they are not there. Um, of course, uh, uh, this draft law, it prescribes not only in peace, but uh, all high officials from, from, from the government, key positions, not only them, they should be in Ukraine, but also their families. Uh, so by our personal example, we show that uh, we are here, we are with, everyone, and we are with our citizens, and uh, we will manage, we don't have other choice. The second one is yesterday, uh, the president of Ukraine uh, ordered that uh, because of escalation of conflict uh, as of yesterday, a number of MPs, including the prime minister of Ukraine, will go on the front line in the, that hot spots. Um, basically, for me, the only exclusion is that the Munich Security Conference, I was allowed to, 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 to visit this event, but I'm going back to Ukraine tomorrow, and starting from Monday, we hell, have a number of uh, extra events that popped up in the, our timetable yesterday and today. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, uh, to, to do our best uh, um, to keep the citizens calm, because, you know, uh, we do our best, although it's, it's, it's quite hard. We also amended uh, the timetable of the parliament. The next week was supposed to be a week, uh, uh, in, the, uh, week in the regions. Uh, but all MPs, 100% MPs, it's the order of the president should stay in Kiev. Uh, they are not uh, allowed even to go in the region, to the regions in order for the emergency situation to be able to come to the parliament within two hours and be ready to adopt uh, crucial decisions. Hopefully it will not happen. Hopefully it won't. Arisa, if I can pull you in there and say, put that question to you as well. What can what the West do at this point or what can people do in terms of companies, NGOs, all the actors involved? 
Well, I think it's fantastic that we are bringing emotions into this because, you know, emotions are driving politics uh, and not driving this conflict. I think uh, fundamentally for Russia, it's the emotion of uh, humiliation, a certain, you know, uh, greatness we spoke about, but mostly it's the humiliation that they feel, uh, or Putin personally feels, suffered after the collapse of the Soviet Union. In Ukraine, actually, the dominant emotion until recent escalation is the emotion of hope and optimism. A lot of Ukrainians believe that their children will live better off, that, uh, you know, that the country deserves better. And that hope was recaptured in Euromaidan, unfortunately, with this tragic event that Helena mentioned, that, that was dearly paid by Ukrainian citizens who died for that. And this is exactly that emotion of hope that Putin wants to stamp at the core. And the idea of his strategy is to say, look, the West has abandoned you. You guys, you know, whatever they say, they pay you a lip service. When the rubber will hit the road, you'll be alone. That's why what could be done, I think, and is, is already being done, is this campaign of stand with Ukraine. Emotionally, it's very important. Remember, Ukraine is a global nation. There are more than 20 million Ukrainians living in all cities. Munich used to be a major center of Ukrainian exile, university and government, intellectuals and writers. And Ukrainians are purpose all over, from Argentina to Vladivostok. Uh, and I think connecting with Ukrainian communities internationally and showing uh, support is very important. I would like to point actually to the economic factor, because even without invasion, Ukraine is already paying a high cost for this invasion. It's very, I think, commendable that EU has approved quite substantial 1.2 billion micro-financial assistance. Uh, I think it's not enough. U.S. is, you know, uh, contributing. What we need is a kind of a new instrument to ensure political and geopolitical risks for companies who decide to stay in Ukraine, who are not taking their capital out, because it's all about resilience. This is what I'm saying. We are here in the long haul. Uh, of course, Putin may choose to escalate up and down, but this confrontation between um, Western uh, rule-based order and, and Russian uh, view of, and you know, Russia Chinese to a certain degree, you can say there is a shaping of a certain uh, similarity will continue. And, and I think that Germany here, because we are, you know, with the Munich Security Conference, has to think about its role in Europe. People are expecting more of Germany, uh, more mm -hmm. engagement. And, and I think we should not fall in this trap of comparing Russia to the Soviet Union of the 60s, 70s and 80s, when, remember, Soviet Union needed hard currency to buy grain. That's why they were constructive. That's why they were negotiating Helsinki agreements. I don't think that blueprint is um, at this point relevant. And, and I think we should, um, we should get used to this uncertainty and base policy not on wishful thinking, but on these realities on the ground and partner with people and countries who stand by the values and who are ready, you know, like Ukraine, mm -hmm. is ready to defend itself. And I think that is, despite of anxiety, is very important signal. So you, you bring up an interesting point, and I'm going to actually invite uh, Maki uh, Kuziemski up on the stage. Thank you, MK, for your question, because you've sparked a whole new debate. As, an, as he comes up on stage, I want to put that point across. The one thing that struck me perhaps last week, was this movement by the Russian Central Bank where we know the inflation is an issue when Russia, as it is in Europe, as it is in the US, um, everyone's been affected. But Elvira Nebulina's statement of wanting to make be ready for short-term changes in monetary policy and interest rate movement and the flexibility she was talking about literally sounded to me like wartime monetary policy that she was preparing for the long run because she did not want to see the ruble do exactly what it did when Crimea was um, invaded. It feels like we're also forgetting another element in this conversation, perhaps, that Ukraine does provide, what is it, is it the fourth largest provider of European food 
um, we seem to have left that part of security out as well. So I want to get a perspective of, are you getting the feeling that this is, we're waiting for the long run in this? He, he's, he's in it for the long haul. He's going to keep playing these games for as long as it takes with Ukraine. And are we ready for our food security to be impacted considering food prices across Europe are already high? If I can ask you, Vidar, what do you make of that angle? Well, back to where I started, the it's really the big question. Is, um, is the West able to play the long game here and uh, put up with uh, uh, short-term and mid-term consequences, suffering electoral disturbances uh, from standing up for a principle? Um, and there was this mention of trust. I think the most important trust dimension here is between the Ukrainian people and other people that trust the European security order and that Europe needs to retain that trust. That would also, in my view, create the necessary credibility and predictability for longer term negotiations with Russia of any changes to the security order. So that is the most important uh, trust dimension. And I, I agree that in this context, we need American leadership, but we also need European leadership. and. Um, when you're looking for European strategic leadership, it's not always easy to see, but I think um, we can't escape thinking of need for more leadership to come from the country we're in right now. Um, the UK has opted out of, of uh, Europe in many ways, not in the security realm necessarily, but politically they're on the sidelines. Um, and then I think we... Uh, we are in need of um, strong, strategic, long-term leadership from one of Europe's, uh, or the biggest country, and, and uh, that would be Germany. If I can ask you, Nicholas, um, are you seeing any concerns in the agricultural, the industrial world? Uh, are you hearing stories and reports of Ukrainian uh, agricultural companies, farmers, uh, concerned about the exports that they're going to have to send out or any blockages there? Because we, I haven't really heard um, too much of concern on that front. Or are we not worried about one of Ukraine's biggest exports? So, yeah, I mean, Ukraine is an agricultural superpower and it's not just feeding Europe, it's feeding the Near East. I mean, most of the bread consumed in Egypt and you know, other regions that have seen a lot of instability comes from grain that comes from Ukraine. So um, those you know, regions that are probably a lot less able to um, deal with short term price hikes, um, that is going to be a direct impact. So in terms of the, the kind of knock on from these tensions, well, first off, it's about exports that go by sea from Odessa. The Russians are currently carrying out what they call uh, you know, exercises in the Black Sea, which have seen Lloyds of London and other insurers basically saying that the Ukrainian and Russian parts of the Black Sea are dangerous. We're not going to insure any commercial shipping going through there. Ukrainians are trying to kind of find some new shipping routes that go closer to the, uh, you know, to the shorelines of Romania and Bulgaria. But still, it's a big break on export of those uh, crops. So that will be difficult, I guess, more um, if this continues later on in the year once the harvest is in. But more short term, now we're in February, March, April is when the time, it's time where those grain crops are sown in the south of Ukraine. And that requires huge amounts of diesel and other energy for the tractors, for the agriculture machines. And Ukraine has really missed an opportunity to reduce its dependence on uh, oil products coming from Russia via Belarus. Um, there, there used to be some coming from Lithuania, but they again had to come through Belarus. The Belarusians have stopped that. And if you know Ukraine, uh, if Belarus were to you know buy on command from Moscow, suddenly you know organize some oh well you know pipeline issues. Sorry, you know we can't uh, ship any energy to you right now because you know the pipeline exploded. Then that could have very short term knock you know knock on effects for Ukraine's ability to its fields and then you know, feeding uh, Europe and the Near East uh, later on this year. We've got Mackie here, so uh, can I get your inputs on this, please? Um, sure, absolutely. Um, coming to relate to this panel, let me still um, kind of, you know, go, to the, go back to the basics and state the obvious, right? That I, I really think that um, it is important to underline that Putin is a bully. He's not going to stop at Kharkiv. He's not going to stop at Kiev. He's not going to stop at Lviv, right? Um, I think one of the um, former national security advisors of um, President Trump had a 
surprisingly um, uh, spot on observation, right? Who's gonna die for um, Tallinn? Who's gonna die for Estonia, right? So I see this effort as a, um, as a kind of long-term game um, that, um, that has two levels, right? Domestically, um, it is about destroying Ukraine. It's not about seizing Ukraine, it's about destroying its prospects, um, its aspiration um, of this very successful nation. And then um, internationally, it is about um, making a crack in uh, Western unity and, and really testing the limits of um, Article 5 of, um, of um, uh, NATO. And speaking of um, Western unity, right, I think um, there's a lot of talk in, uh, at MSC of transatlantic unity, but I don't think we can really speak about transatlantic unity without European unity. And we don't have that today, right? Um, hearing um, Italian officials saying that energy um, um, sanctions are, are no-go, hearing German officials uh, being very reluctant about arming um, Ukraine, that doesn't sound as unity at all, right? So I think, um, and I agree that we, 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 we can't um, think about um, a new architecture of, um, of European security under pressure, but um, I see this situation as a um, kind of belated homework that we have to do um, because um, Uncle Sam is not going to uh, always be there to, to help us Europeans deal with our um, situation, right? But um, so this hasn't uh, started today. This will not end tomorrow. This is a, a marathon, right? So what could be done? I think um, two things. I still think um, I'm still a big believer in sanctions. Um, Russia has been very successful in really adapting to the sanctions, but it's um, only because that we haven't really gone um, uh, far with them, right? We didn't strike where it hurts. So I really um, see that um, there is an opportunity to escalate, to um, think of how do we um, uh, really um, um, have an, uh, a, an equivalent, a kind of pan-European equivalent of Magnitsky Act, right? How do we seize assets? Um, no more schmoozing in San Moritz or Saint Tropez. Let them ski in uh, Kamchatka, right? Um, if we if we go after the inner circle, I mean, honestly, I think this is this is, and this is where um, we we can see um, hypocrisy, right? Um, half of London's downtown is um, is owned by um, by inner by Putin's inner circle, right? So um, seize their chateaus, their yachts. Are we able to go there? Is this um, what we can do? So this is one level. And then, of course, there's a number of other things, right? So SWIFT, um, closing EU airspace, things that will really um, hurt. But um, things that I, I think it's important to underline, we should be looking at things that will hurt the, um, Putin's inner circle and not Russian people, right? Um, and then there's this human level, right? Um, I was asked to provide a Polish perspective. Um, Poland has... Um, I think north of 1.5 million um, Ukrainians um, living there, very well integrated, being really a backbone of the economy. Um, there are projections of more than 5 million um, possibly um, trying to cross the border should the conflict escalate. So I think what we could do um, all as individuals within our organizations is think of, well, two things. One, how do we really kind of try to um, keep um, ties with Ukrainian um, stakeholders, companies, how do we integrate um, Ukrainian companies in whatever we do, right? And then on the other hand, how do we provide platform for Ukrainians, um, for the Ukrainian diaspora to really speak up? Because, well, too often um, um, the region is, um, is being, uh, and the future of the region is being discussed um, without the representatives of, um, of the region itself, right? And I think Nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. And I'll, ask, I'll, I'll finish with a question um, to actually um, Stephen, Jessica, and um, Orissa, because I think um, I get a sense from this panel that there is a sort of understanding that NATO has overpromised and underdelivered. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking a, a, an honest question, right? Um, what should we as um, Western countries do um, in terms of what we promise to Ukraine, um, are we still thinking of uh, prospects of um, Ukrainian um, membership in NATO? Mm -hmm. um, and if not, what is the type of relationship that we want to build? Because I think this is, at the end of the day, what we owe to Ukraine and, and its people. 
Well, we've got about four minutes left, so let's make this a closing statement from everybody involved. Um, and you bring up something that a lot of people have told me as well. Freeze and seize. Why aren't we doing it? We don't go far enough. And a lot of people have also said, did, were you surprised they took SWIFT off the table? That would have actually gone far enough. So let's make your question the closing statement. Can I start with you, Galina, and then we will go to Rissia. Just following your comment, before our panel, there was a panel with Secretary General who was telling about the open door policy. And there was a question to him about Ukraine. And he told, well, you know, all the countries who would like to join NATO, they do it. While there are countries who, who doesn't want to do it, like Finland. Ukraine does want to join NATO. We uh, expressed our wish to join NATO a number of years ago. Um, yesterday, I have asked uh, the, the colleague from uh, the NATO headquarters about the Madrid summit that will come in June, and the president of Ukraine will participate in this. Ukraine, Ukraine dreams about membership action plan, because I'm, uh, as an MP, I'm in the delegation of Ukrainian parliament to the NATO parliamentary assembly regularly. Every three months, we report on what we have done. We have adopted this dr draft laws, laws, this reforms. What else? Like, we are ready. And, uh, but having the, the point of the general secretary, all the countries who would like to join, they are there. But do you, do you see us? We want, we want to join, really. And uh, um, it, true that no talks about Ukraine, about the destiny of Ukraine without Ukraine. Ukraine does want to join NATO and EU. It is in our constitution. We have also amended the constitution and it is there about our aspirations. Uh, we do uh, hope that we will succeed. There is no way around. But in terms of this conflict, yes, it will be not solved today and tomorrow. It's geographical position of Ukraine. It cannot change. We would like to escape, to escape from our neighbor. But it's impossible to have it. And we think that the problem will stay there till Putin will, uh, will stay in his presidential chair. And this is a conversation that can go on for a long time, and we should continue it um, in all the breaks that we have. The reason we meet in Munich is critical, uh, and it's, this is part of it. So I'm going to give Bidar um, closing comments and uh, you know, addressing the point of what we are talking about at this point. Well, I, I would agree that uh, Very quickly. this time tougher sanctions will be much needed. Um, I was Norway's Minister of Europe for Europe in 2014, and I do recall that discussions about sanctions and energy sanctions were sort of a challenge to try to minimize the effects of, on our energy sector, and you have the similar discussions throughout. But we need to realize that the future of the European security architecture is more important than individual economic impacts uh, of sanctions on European countries. So, yes, they need, to, they need to strike where they hurt. Strike where they hurt. Stephen, um, solutions, ideas, what can be done as we go forward as your closing comment? Yeah, well, I think we're going to have to uh, really take an account of power realities and what the consequences of actions that we're contemplating will be. We can't just operate on the basis of we want to support the rules uh, because that can have negative consequences. I think we've come to that point. There's nothing magical about NATO membership. Um, what's important is the credibility of the deterrent that NATO membership has provided for a long time. That doesn't mean it will continue. So it will be very important to reinforce the countries in the East going forward now that we've gotten uh, uh, more information about Russian intentions, all to the negative. Um, so perhaps I'll just leave it there. Erisia, closing comments? You know, I think the outcome of the future architecture of Europe that we're all pondering, it really depends whether Ukraine will be able to wrestle out of Russian embrace that Russia started losing severely from 2014 and maintain its sovereignty, 
Well, uh, the future of Ukrainian borders, you know, it's a question, but I think the, the, the struggle right now is whether Ukraine will be able to remain a sovereign nation. That's why I don't think the promise of neutrality is a solution. Neither the NATO moratorium is a solution because that's not what Putin is after. I think he is trying to lead us into this NATO discourse because it's both familiar to Russian populations and it's familiar to, there's a certain guilt in some communities in the West about NATO enlargement. This experience today, let's remember, is shaping Ukrainians' views about the security. Who is standing by Ukraine today? Who is ally of Ukraine? And who is running away from Ukraine? And Ukrainians see that NATO is standing by, uh, is sharing intelligence. Some member NATO member states are standing by and mm -hmm. support for NATO is increasing. So we have to remember that, you know, we will be living in a new world depending on the outcome of this, uh, uh, of this war. Nicholas, thank you for organizing this, uh, this conversation in the first place. So the last word is yours. Have at it. Just very briefly, I think we're seeing now on the back of this crisis that the renewable energy debate that had previously been just about climate change and had kind of been in a silo separate from security, that is now those two debates are coming together. And you know, we're seeing the Green uh, Minister Habeck in Germany talking about reducing uh, dependence on Russia, a situation where Germany sold its gas storage to Gazprom. Uh, which predictably has run down those stocks just in this moment of tensions. Um, I think you know that will increasingly be uh, on the agenda to make yeah Europe less uh, vulnerable to uh, pressure um, in in terms of security questions. Well, thank you all very much for laying some of the groundwork out, and I think we. Uh, we it's kind of like what you point out, right? We need solutions. We need to think about more solution seeking and can't close the door. This is for the long haul. So thank you all very much for joining me. Uh, I really appreciate your time. It's a last minute conversation, but who can avoid Ukraine at this point? As you said, 24 hours out, it feels like weeks. Give them a round of applause, please. We'll catch you right back here half past the hour. <laughs>